2022 is a bad year to be an M&A investment banker, and it's been a rough start to 2023. Through January, the total value of global M&A was on pace to drop about 25% in the first quarter compared to the fourth quarter of 2022. We have seen a couple of unsolicited large offers in recent days, but we had no $10 billion plus deals announced during the first month of the year. What will it take to get M&A going and improve the outlook for the investment banking businesses? We'll talk about that with RBC bank analyst Gerard Cassidy on this episode of The Pipeline, an S&P Global Market Intelligence podcast. I'm Joe Mantone, an editor with S&P Global Market Intelligence, and your host to the Pipeline Podcast, where we provide insights into M&A, IPOs, and all things deal-making. I've covered investment banks for years and listened to many, many earnings conference calls of large banks. On those calls, equity research analysts ask questions of management teams, and one of my favorite big bank analysts is Gerard Cassidy. I like Gerard because not only is he a great bank analyst who created the Texas Ratio, which is an indicator that helps regulators and bank management teams determine uh, the likelihood of a, of a bank failure, but I also like Gerard because he is one of the few analysts who regularly asks executives at the large banks about their investment banking businesses. I caught up with Gerard in January, soon after the big banks reported year-end 2022 earnings. The fourth quarter ended a woeful year for the investment banking businesses at Citi, JPM, Goldman Sachs, B of A, and Morgan Stanley. Combined, those companies reported a nearly 50% drop in revenue from their equity capital markets, debt capital markets, and M&A advisory revenue in 2022 compared to 2021. Many of those in and around the investment banking businesses have noted that they think the second half of 2023 will be better than the first half of the year when it comes to deal making. That's where we pick up the conversation with RBC Capital Markets Analyst Gerard Cassidy with me asking Gerard about why the second half of the year may be better than the first half of the year. It's making the assumption that the markets will be more stabilized because the Federal Reserve should be finished with its monetary tightening um, strategy or tool by raising short-term interest rates. So by taking interest rates out of the picture, meaning rising rates, that hopefully will offer some clarity to the outlook for companies that may want to do acquisitions or go public. Now, certainly quantitative tightening is still underway, which is another tool they use for monetary policy. But the increases in Fed funds rates, the forward curve is suggested by the middle of this year, it should be over. And if it is over, again, there should be more stability in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, so that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you, is what has to change in order for deal making to pick up? I mean, you just touched on the, the Fed. I mean, a, any other indicators? You know, are you looking at the VIX? I would say it's you know the economic indicators. What the yield curve is telling us. You know, should the economy not go into a recession? It's a soft landing. And that would be very positive for the capital markets businesses, particularly investment banking. Um, so many of the economic indicators, whether it's the initial unemployment claims number that comes out weekly every Thursday morning or the monthly jobs report or, you know, the PMI numbers, you know, everything is looked at carefully. And as people get more confident that the economy is stabilizing or improving, you know, it's still the economy in the fourth quarter of 20. 2022, according to the Atlanta Federal Reserve, which does the real GDP now forecast, they're still calling for about a 4% real GDP growth number. So to go from 4% to a negative number may take time, meaning into the second half of 2023. Should it not appear, meaning it doesn't turn negative, again, could be another real positive sign for the investment banks. Sure. Okay. And, and what businesses do you expect to bounce back first, whether ECM, DCM, or I, I would say it's probably going to be DCM. That that would be one followed by the 
ECM and IPOs, and then the advisory after that. Yeah, I'm a little surprised to hear you say DCM. I, I, I was just kind of thinking with the higher rates, you know, companies would be um, less likely to, to be issuing debt. Mm. I think what you'll see is that the debt markets are always open because if an issuer is willing to pay the rate, generally speaking, there are buyers out there for the debt. You can't really say that about the ECM market because, you know, if investors are going to shun IPOs because they have been losing money owning stocks, it's tougher sometimes to open up that market. So DCM to us, if the borrowers are willing to pay the higher rate, they're certainly able to issue debt. They just may not like the cost of it. Gotcha, gotcha. That makes sense. And then on M and A, I mean M and A, you know, it, it always seems like the longest to come back. Why does M and A take longer to come back? I, I would say because you have to, you know, find willing sellers. Of course, that's one. Number two, the buyers themselves have to be confident enough that the outlook for the economy is improving and they want to be certain of that before maybe they jump in and, and do a deal that um, you know could prove to be distracting as they're trying to close the deal but at the same time running their own business and in a more challenging economy, it might just be too risky to do that. That certainly makes sense. And, and you know, I've heard a lot of executives, the, the big banks and, and the, the the more advisory-focused investment banks, uh, talk about how uh, conversations uh, on M&A deals with clients have been ongoing all throughout 2022 and how the level of dialogue has been has, has remained robust. Do you put any stock into that? I mean, they kind of say that as an indication that M&A will bounce back you know, you know, once it gets going, do you think that's sort of a, a valid point? Yes, I think, you know, when it comes to M&A, there are, of course, are hostile deals that happen. But generally speaking, the majority of mergers and acquisitions are done on a friendly basis. And in doing so, there's a courtship. And the courtship between companies can take months or years. And so as a result, you're going to see that even during challenging times, companies are talking to one another. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll do a deal, but you know it's not a on-off switch where people you know turn it off because the economy is more challenged. Um, they keep it on throughout the cycle and they continue to keep the dialogue going. And it is no surprise that when you hear the investment banks talk today, they are indicating that those dialogues are continuing. Mm -hmm. And then David Sala on the Goldman Sachs call, their CEO, he had mentioned that you know it typically takes four to six quarters uh, before M and A uh, picks back up after um, you know a downturn. Is that, from your experience, is that something that uh, that that time frame does that sound about right to you? Yes, it does. The players in that market want to be certain that they're not maybe taking on it added leverage to complete a deal and then unfortunately run into a problem with the economy. So the deal activity does lag cycles. So it to us, um, that sounds about right. Right. And you mentioned leverage. It, you know, it seems there's been a, some real cooling in a leverage loan market. Do you think that the large banks have an appetite to, to, to fund leverage loans at this point of the cycle? I would say there's always an opportunity for banks to to make leverage loans and underwrite you know leverage situations but in this kind of environment they're more conservative so is there an appetite it, yes there's always an appetite but it's not a very big appetite today in our view and once again i think it has a lot to do with the expectation that we're likely to see you know an economic slowdown or a recession and when that happens the leverage loan defaults move up meaningfully from the period we're in today. So I can understand why people would want to have less exposure here than possibly three or four years ago. Right, right. And the private equity firms are often the, the players involved in, in those leveraged buyouts. And and I, and I you were asking on the JPM call, you were asking about their uh, lending to private equity firms. It, was that kind of what you were getting at? Were you kind of asking about the, the leverage, the loan market there? I would say that when I was discussing the leveraged loan market with uh, J.P. Morgan, our focus is 
the private equity area because, as you have seen, a number of companies that were valued at extremely high valuations in the fall of 2021 have come down materially in value. And if banks are lending into these private equity firms and they're using the funds to maybe acquire somebody or to fund one of their portfolio companies and they're using it with borrowings from the bank, we'd like to know about that because the deprecation in value has been material and that could affect the loan. So it's an area that's very opaque and it's an area that's grown very fast over the last five years for for these large universal banks and investment banks. And whenever we see rapid growth in a riskier lending area heading into an economic slowdown or a recession, it often spells, you know, an increase in credit problems, which is the reason we've been asking this question of banks. And have you been satisfied with the answers that you've been getting? No, we're not. I mean, it's still too opaque. We would, I think many investors would like to see the size of these portfolios and then broken out by, you know, not necessarily individual company names, but how much is exposed to the telecommunications sector or the software sector or biotech, just so that investors have a better understanding of what they're getting into. Right. And then so the, you would like to see the, the loans made to private equity firms and, and what sector those PE firms are focused on? Is that kind of what you're... That and, and also just, you know, if you, let's say it's KKR or Carlisle who takes down a $100 million loan from J.P. Morgan, what are they using it for? Is it to then lend it to one of its their portfolio companies to help them grow their business uh, is the is the loan going to be used to buy another company to put into the portfolio so it's all of those types of questions that investors need to get their arms around mm -hmm. and which banks do you think are the biggest players in in that market there Generally speaking, it's the investment banks, so Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs. Uh, also, the, the larger banks, such as J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank America, Wells Fargo, are all players in this space. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, okay, w was there any comments that you heard around the conference calls that could make you any more optimistic about the advisory capital markets um, outlook or – you know, as you're feeling sort of the same? We would say that our expectations were generally met about the business and it really has not changed those expectations. But we're keeping an eye on, you know, again, different in indices to try to see when the pivoting point should come. We think it's a little early right now, but we're we're trying to, you know, keep an eye out for it so we don't miss it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, you know, we, we've heard about you know, there's been some reports out there about some banks that are making some headcount reductions in their investment banking units. Do you think we'll, we'll see more of that, or is it uh, kind of played out by now? In terms of the headcount reductions, we have to remember that 2020 and 2021 were record years for the investment banking industry, particularly 2021. Because of that activity and because of the strength of revenues, many of these banks went out and hired thousands of people in 2020 and 2021. Now, with business coming back to normal levels in 2022, you can argue, was below normal levels, we anticipate to see the right sizing of the personnel departments of these companies. And it started, Goldman uh, let over 3,200 people go, or about 3,200, and Morgan Stanley, it was, I believe, over a thousand. So we are expecting, you know, these companies, similar to years past or cycles past, to, you know, align their expenses now with a lower revenue environment. The real question is going to be in the first half of 2020. Three, what if business doesn't come back and it's as dreadful as it was in 2022? Then there probably is going to be another round of downsizing to bring the expenses in line with the depressed revenues. And when revenues do come back, and they will, it just it takes time. It, again, they won't be at that 2020 or 2021 level. It will be more, we think, similar to the numbers that were achieved for the industry in 2017, 18 that time period. What types of personnel are being affected? Is it, you know, some more of the, the the junior staff or senior bankers? We see it affecting, you know, all levels of personnel. Um, do you really need today SPAC 
investment bankers. So, you know, managing directors that were in the SPAC space that was red hot in the first quarter of 2021. Is it really a need for, the, or is there a need for as many of them today? The answer is no. So it's not just, you know, the junior level employees, but it could go, you know, quite high if the business has not really recovered. Mm-hmm. And then just thinking about, you know, the, the five large banks, you know, JPM, Citi, B of A, Goldman, and Morgan Stanley, are any of them better positioned to, to sort of take market share in, in the current environment? I would say that those, you know, the five dominant banks continue to see their market share increase within the five Goldman, Morgan Stanley, and J.P. Morgan seem to be setting themselves apart. But then this quarter, you know, Merrill Lynch had a real strong quarter. So I think as a percentage of the industry wallet, as it's referred to, you know, the amount of business that is in the investment banking business, the big five, I think, will continue to garner slightly higher market shares going forward because they tend to attract some very strong people and have great um, brand recognition that is needed in the advisory business. Huh. Yeah, it was funny because B of A seemed to be the only company of the five that spoke positively about their investment bank business. Correct. Right. Correct. They're talking about getting more relationships with their commercial bankers, right? That's part of it. Bank America went on a very focused expansion of their investment banking business probably five or six years ago now to bring it down to the middle market commercial customer. You know, they weren't always hunting for elephants. And I think that's, you know, playing out to their benefit in these types of uh, markets that we're experiencing today. That'll do it for this episode of the Pipeline Podcast. We thank Gerard for taking the time to discuss the investment banking businesses with us, and we thank you for listening.